The Keystone is an oil pipeline system in Canada and the United States. Commissioned in 2010 and owned by Trans Canada TC Energy, it currently exports about 700,000 barrels per day, over 2,000 miles from Alberta to refineries and oil tank farms in the Midwest and Texas. The proposed Keystone XL, with XL standing for Export Limited, would have connected the pipeline terminals in southern Alberta to Steel City, Nebraska, by a shorter route and larger diameter pipe. At peak capacity, it was expected to transport 830,000 barrels per day of Alberta oil sands to refineries in the Gulf Coast of Texas. From there, the oil would have been sent chiefly overseas, not to gas pumps in the United States. Just to put things in context, in 2021, the U.S. produced more than 19 million and exported more than 3 million barrels per day, much of which was transported through the 3 million miles of oil and gas pipelines already running through our country. But the Keystone isn't your average pipeline, and tar sands oil isn't your average crude. In Alberta, Canada, Along the Athabasca River lie the world's third largest reserve of oil. Bitumen, a very thick and heavy form of oil, coats grains of sand and other minerals in a deposit that covers 60,000 square miles. In 2021, the Alberta oil sands were able to produce 3.3 million barrels per day, but doing so comes with a steep economic and environmental cost. After excavation, the rocks are crushed and combined with hot water and solvents like sodium hydroxide, which is lye, in giant toxic ponds to separate the solid rock from the crude. After this, the bitumen is still too thick and acidic to run through a pipeline effectively, so it is mixed with natural gas and more solvents, lowering the viscosity and raising the pH enough to allow the resulting caustic slurry, known as diluted bitumen, Dilbit to be transported more economically. This process produces a huge amount of water pollution and by 2021 is responsible for over 60 square miles of deadly man-made ponds which are capable of killing entire flocks of birds that are unfortunate enough to land on its surface and they will remain toxic for decades. Only about 20% of the Alberta oil sands are shallow enough to recover by surface mining. The rest is extracted through a much more expensive in situ process known as fracking. In total, the mining and processing has claimed over 537 square miles of boreal forest, and Canadian environmentalists have not been quiet about it, calling it the world's most destructive oil operation, and have been fighting its expansion in and out of courts for over 10 years. But this is about America, not Canada. Dilbit is thicker, more acidic, and more corrosive than lighter conventional crude. This ups the likelihood that a pipeline carrying it will leak. One study found that pipelines moving tar sands oil spilled three times more per mile than the U.S. national average. Since it first went into operation in 2010, TC Energy's original Keystone Pipeline system has leaked more than a dozen times. One incident in North Dakota, a witness reported seeing a 60-foot geyser of tar sands oil spewing into the air of more than 380,000 gallons. Making things worse, leaks can be difficult to detect. And when Dilbit does spill, it's more difficult to clean up than conventional crude because it sinks to the bottom of waterways. People and wildlife coming in contact with tar sands oil are exposed to a plethora of known carcinogens that are not present in regular crude. Another example is the 2010 Kalamazoo oil spill of almost a million barrels that took five years and $1.2 billion to clean up. Fueled by more than a dozen spills, the Keystone Pipeline, based over a decade of sustained protests from environmental activists, indigenous communities, religious leaders, farmers, ranchers, and business owners along its proposed path. In 2011, 1,200 people were arrested in front of the White House protesting the Keystone. A month later, 
10,000 people showed up in solidarity, completely surrounding the White House grounds, and the movement only grew from there. In 2013, 40,000 people marched forward for climate in D.C. In 2014, farmers, ranchers, and indigenous leaders came together to form the Cowboy and Indian Alliance and assembled teepees and wagons on the National Mall for the Reject and Protect demonstration. Also in 2014, the People's Climate March flooded New York City with over 400,000 people, making sure the Keystone XL was a top issue. By 2015, the XL was internationally known for attracting opposition from indigenous groups in South Dakota and Montana who were physically blocking work on the pipelines. While the pipeline's proposed path did not travel on Native American reservations, in several cases it would straddle those lands and run close to or cross over multiple water sources that the people on the land rely on for drinking. In northeast Montana, the proposed line would be less than a mile from Fort Peck Indian Reservation, and it would cross the Missouri River, which supplies drinking water sources for the reservation as well as non-reservation chunks of northeast Montana. The Keystone XL became a symbol of the battle over climate change and fossil fuels. In 2015, it was temporarily delayed by President Obama. In January 2017, President Trump took actions intended to permit the pipeline's completion, but little was accomplished during his time in office. On January 20th, 2021, President Joe Biden signed an executive order revoking the permit and on June 9th of that year, TC Energy formally abandoned the plans for the Keystone XL pipeline. The hippies had won. Okay, okay. I told you all of that so I can say all of this. In May of 2022, gas went over $5 a gallon in every state of the union. And the question is obvious. Did Biden contribute to the rise in gas prices by revoking the XL permit? First off, the pipeline is just a pipeline. It doesn't produce anything. It only moves petroleum after it's been extracted. According to TC Energy, 2023 would have been the earliest the XL could have been completed, and it would have not immediately been running at full capacity. Without the XL, in 2021, Alberta oil sands exported an average of 700,000 barrels uh, through the Keystone and 400,000 barrels via truck and rail to oil refineries in the U.S. Energy executives and analysts agree there is ample pipeline and rail capacity to move additional barrels from Alberta to U.S. oil refining hubs, even without the infamous XL. So the pipeline halt doesn't seem to have impacted the total global supply of oil. When we talk about gas being over $5 a gallon, we can't forget about Western sanctions on over 10 million barrels a day of Russian oil. That has a tremendous effect on the market, driving up the price of gas in the U.S. from $3.50 a gallon at the end of February to $4.50 a gallon less than a month later in March, and over $5 a gallon at the end of May. But oil prices started going up before that. When Biden got into office, it was only $2.50 a gallon. You might not remember, but way back in 2020, people did everything imaginable to avoid getting sick. They stopped going out to eat, businesses were closed for months, entire industries shut down. That resulted in drastically lowering demand and the price for oil. It cost an average of $23 to produce a barrel of oil in the United States. So, when the price of oil went into negative territory, most private companies either slowed or stopped production until the prices came back up. But, increasing production is very expensive and often requires new investors. Once medicine caught up with the demands of society, people started to go to restaurants, concerts, barbecues, and just generally participate in the economy like before. So demand for oil shot back up, fast. But supply did a poor job ramping up production, and prices all over the world quickly rose. 
Some of the hesitancy to ramp up can be explained away by simple greed. The lower the supply gets, the higher the prices go. There is also a bit of self-preservation at work. Oil companies saw lower prices and shrinking profits for a decade. It's only natural for them to wait and make sure the economy is fully open before investing the tens or hundreds of millions of dollars needed to start new oil extraction projects. Biden compounded the problem by coming into office talking a big game on climate change, ending oil subsidies, revoking unused permits, and of course, ending the Keystone XL. The pipeline would have allowed TC Energy to sell Canadian oil for larger profits and return higher dividends to their investors. With its cancellation, on his first day in office, President Biden sent a clear message to the world that he would act on behalf of the environment possibly scaring potential investors away from U.S. petroleum. Someone way smarter than me once said, the market is just a graph of rich people's feelings. And I guess the cancellation of a multi-billion dollar oil pipeline would probably hurt a lot of feelings. So the answer is yes, whether intended or not, Biden canceling the XL sends a message to investors that regulation and the will of the people will be placed over corporate profits, which in turn means slower expansion in the world's number one producer of petroleum. But by how much? The price of fuel went up faster across Europe than the United States. In 2021, we increased oil production by 2 million barrels. That was more than any country other than China. So the effects from Biden spooking the market couldn't have been that dramatic. It certainly seemed less costly than the 2020 sickness and nowhere near the expense of the kerfuffle in Eastern Europe. One major part of the equation I've left out is that the U.S. is the largest consumer of oil in the world, more than doubling that of any other country by capita, which means the U.S. has hurt at least twice as much for every price hike. We are stuck in our ways and it might be painful to get out. The fight over the Keystone XL was not just about an oil pipeline and the environment. It was a fork in the road. We could either continue to allow the oil industry to sully our land while we pay them billions of dollars every year in subsidies, or we could invest in the American economy and become less reliant on oil by opening factories that produce solar panels, wind turbines, and batteries. The choice seems simple to me, and that is why I support the cancellation of the Keystone XL pipeline.